What an incredible privilege. What an honor. What a joy to get the opportunity to sit down and to examine the scriptures together. To read the word of God. To listen to the spirit of God. To kick back and relax. And to consider the things that God wants to do in our life. That God wants to speak to us. That God wants to address with us. You know, I like being saved because one thing I know is that I can entrust myself to someone who's greater than I am, who sees everything, who knows everything, who has the ability to create everything. And because I know he did, I can trust him with my life, with my wife, with my car, with my possessions. I can trust him for my eternity. I can trust him with my salvation. I can trust God with everything I am. I like that because that reminds me, especially looking in Colossians tonight, about who I'm trusting, about what I'm doing with my life, about how I'm giving over my life to someone, to a being that's greater than I am, who loves me and cares for me in such a way that I am amazed at the privilege and the honor to be able to share him in a way that you might be able to discover for yourself who he is, about what he's done, about the amazing thing and the amazing way that God has created all things and caused all things to come into existence so that I, as I am, might give him some kind of pleasure, that he might be able to enjoy with me my life as I employed by salvation his life being worked out in me. Father, I thank you that you've given us this night to consider your word, to sit back, to think back to the moment we got saved, to even go farther back and to consider the fact that you created all things, that you are the creator of heaven and earth, that in the beginning when you spoke, everything came into existence. Wow. That's awesome. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be there in that moment of time when you spoke and it happened. That blows me away. That, that, that just amazes me. Father, I, I thank you that you only give me a small idea of what that's like. Because if I realize how much you've done, I might not think I'm worthy even to be in your presence, much less to speak to you. But because of what you have done, Jesus, I thank you that we can come now and we can approach your place where you live, where you sit and where you're seated in the heavenlies. That we can come before you and look to you for the word of God to be made alive. That we can ask you to speak, Father, so that we could listen. Because God, if you don't speak, we don't hear. If you don't cause the word to become alive, we don't pay attention. If it doesn't fit for our life today, then nothing of it will stick with us and we'll walk away as though we never heard from you today. But oh God, thank you that you're not like that. But what you say, you do. But what you speak into existence happens. But the very fact that you have said it, it goes forth and is accomplished according to your will in your time and the way you want it done. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for being the one that's in control. I thank you that you've given us in this latter days, these last days before you send your son to come and get us. You've given us your spirit that we might be able to be healed, that we might be able to be helped, that we might be able to be changed, that we might be able to be blessed, that we might be able to, in fact, know you. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for making a way that we can know you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I think about that, and I think, wow, what an honor and a privilege to be so chosen by God that he loves me and he wants me to hear his word from him. That blesses me. We've been looking in Colossians in the first chapter. We've been discovering who Jesus is, what he's done, and how he lives in us. We've been uncovering the very fact that we are Colossians. We are so much so like the Colossians that we are brothers and sisters in Jesus. That because we are, 
we have been brought into this relationship so that God could be speaking to us by his word as though he were written today because in fact that's the way it is Colossians is written for you right now to hear from him that's what Colossians the book is and that's what God's doing for you right now in this moment so let's turn in Colossians to chapter 1 verse 15 and let's pick up where we left off reading who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it has pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And in you, or and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through the death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and... I fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wherefore I also labor, striving according to his workings, which worketh in me mightily. You know, as we look in this and as we begin to examine, we looked at it this morning and we talked about the warning that God was given. The warning that says, quite frankly, in Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, referring back to from verse 28 all the way back into verse 23, which is the actual warning that says, God has taken care of us in verse 22 and provided for us a way of salvation. He has provided a means with which we can be made unreprovable, perfect, and holy in his sight, if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and was preached unto every creature which is under heaven, wherever for God, Paul, I am made a minister. We found out and we discovered this morning, and we talked about how the warning was that, not that we would be able to lose our salvation, not that that's possible, because once saved, always saved, of course, because if you're saved, then you're saved. But if you're not saved, then you're not saved. So how do you know if you're saved? When you're saved. Because the person who's drowning doesn't know they're saved. The person who's not drowning knows they're saved. That's the difference. You know, because you're not drowning. Now we know that we know that we know because we know. And the fact of that matter goes into the place where we find out a relationship with God determines pretty much whether we know him or we don't. First John often describes that as if any man be in, uh, let's see. First John describes how if we ha he who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God hath not life, that you know because you have him in you. But if you don't have him, you don't know. And so salvation would be determined as simply as this. The guy who's drowning, while he's still drowning, doesn't know that he's saved, but God says, hey, you're saved even though you're drowning. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, here's how it looks. The guy that's drowning only knows he's going down for the second time. 
But the guy that's going to save him knows he's going to save him when he goes down the third time because he's waiting until he's gotten tired of his struggles. He's gotten frustrated at his own efforts. He can no longer do it himself, and he's willing to turn around his life and cry out and say, I need help. And he's so weak he can't do anything else except to receive that help. That help is what we call salvation. As soon as someone swims up to a person who's drowning, they don't immediately go in and try to save that guy. They'd have to knock him out because the guy might be stronger than you are as a swimmer. He might be able to pull you down and drown you while you're trying to save him. So a lot of times we mistake what salvation is and this gift of salvation that we've been given and the grace that God has extended to us by simply not recognizing the time frame with which it's happening, the hope of the gospel, the hope that you would, if you continue in the faith, receive that salvation that has already been accomplished, that has already been determined, that you'll give up your struggles, you'll give up your hope, you'll depend upon God and you'll learn to walk with him, that you'll talk with God and you'll have a personal relationship with him. Because everything we'll learn in Colossians tonight has been committed unto the Son. Everything is being reconciled by the Son. Everything has been given so that the Son would be able to make this statement as he did in the parables. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. But he would also be able to say to those unprofitable servants, that's a warning. And that's what we talked about this morning, the warning. That Jesus could say, hey, I've seen your miracles, and they're pretty powerful. I've seen the marvelous things you've done in my name. I've seen how magnificent you did in my name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And they go to weeping where there's gnashing of teeth. There's only one place for that. So that doesn't change the idea of salvation. It changes the idea of relationship in the time frame. Because the person who is saved, that's waiting to be saved, that goes down for the last time, God saves to the uttermost. God says, yeah, I knew I was going to save you. God is the one who determines what's saved, always saved, because of course he saves them. He saves them to the uttermost. He knows the timing of when that person will be saved. So for you, you may have questions in your mind. You may be drowning and floundering and going through, you know, beating the air and bashing yourself and kind of beating yourself up trying to figure out if you're saved. Make sure of it. Get saved now. Give up. That's all you got to do. You give up. In order to be saved, it's very simple. In order to ask God to take over your life, in order for God to take over your life, in order for God to save you, by his reconciliation that Jesus has done to bring all things into the ability of the Son to receive all power from the Father in heaven, Jesus died on the cross for you. Jesus made that way by his own blood of the cross to bring you into a relationship with him. Now, if you don't have that relationship, you're not saved. If you have that relationship, you're saved. How do I know? You have a relationship. Now, that relationship is going to bring you into a place of religion that you'll be able to discover how you know you're saved, that you'll realize and recognize those things that are only true to those that have been saved. Because, after all, if you're still floundering around in a swimming pool, you haven't been saved yet, have you? You're not saved. You're still drowning. But once you've been yanked out of that pool, you're yanked out and set up on the sides of the pool, you're saved. You've been taken from that place of drowning and dying and placed in a secure place so that you're saved. Now, if you die back into that pool and you're drowning, isn't that kind of like stupid? Wouldn't that be kind of questionable about if you're saved from drowning? So eternal life isn't something that we just simply say, well, you know, you can just get it because it was done and that just takes care of it. No, because we still go back to First John and we say in the Son, do you have the Son, you have life. So how do you know? How do you want to live your life? Do you want to be uncertain of it or do you want to be certain of it? Well, we can have certainty. We read in Colossians the certainty of what we have. For in Colossians, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. As you look up into verse 14 and you look up into 13 and you look up unto 12, you see, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of life, who has delivered us from the powers of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 15 is simply letting us know that back in 13, we know it's the kingdom of his dear son. We know that his son 
has become and always has been the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn of every creature or new creature. That's why he's called the firstborn. He is the firstborn of the new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. The scripture that we realize is that if any man be in Jesus, he is a new creation. Not a new creature, but a new creation. Old things are passed away. Your flesh you live in will pass away. The time frame is what's going to accomplish in the future. The hope of the gospel, the glory that is yet to be revealed in you, that you shall become that with which God wants to present you before his Father in exceeding joy, that the work that he's done through the blood of the cross will make you perfect, blameless, unreprovable in the sight of God. How he does that is the beauty of the joy of your relationship. He does that through your obedience to Jesus, through your faithfulness to follow him. Do you want to know Jesus? Then be born again. Jesus said so. Come unto me, I'm easy. No problem. Do what Jesus says, it's easy. But you make it hard if you think that you have to do rules and regulations. You think it's hard because you have been told it's hard by someone making you do it the hard way. You're floundering in the swimming pool. You haven't learned how to swim yet. So if you learned how to swim, you wouldn't have been drowning in the first place. How did you get yourself into that mess? Once you're saved, you won't do that. Get yourself into that mess. But once you've given it over to God, then you have a lifeguard who's watching over you, who's ready to save you from every situation that you find yourself in. Circumstances. So, knowing that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that means that Jesus is God. That means that because Jesus is God, we, being created by him, can give our life to God, and God can do what God does. Think about that for a minute. Take a moment to think for a moment. What if you were God? What could you do? Really? What if you were God? What would you do? Well, save yourself first, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd know you're saved, right? So, there you go. Now, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. What can't Jesus do? Think about that. Remember, put it back into, if you have to, if you want to know what God can do or what Jesus can do, put it back into that question. What if I were God? What would I do? Toast them. Roast them. Bust them. Snap your fingers and they'd be annihilated, right? So if God can do those things, if you were God, then since you're not God, can't God do what God does? What can't God do? God can do everything. And that's why we have to recognize Jesus being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That means that he is God and he can do anything and everything. We're the ones who flounder in the swimming pool. When in reality, all we have to do is say, help, and he'd pull us out. That's what God does. Jesus, in his name, Jesus, is called salvation. God saves. So if God saves Yeshua Mashiach, or Yeshua, or Yeshua, Yehoshua, Joshua, then the very fact of his name means that he saves. So you, as a flounderer, not yet learned how to swim, can cry out to Jesus and be saved. You could be saved from your job, you could be saved from your life, you could be saved from your circumstance, you could be saved from the future, you could be saved from the past, you could be saved from the demons that are running around trying to get a hold of you. You could be saved from Satan. What are you saved from and are you saved? In other words, there's more to salvation than simply eternal life. Well, that's what you get by way of the gospel being preached to you and you being given salvation will attain to the hope of the gospel, which is your eternal life. That's what God will give you by way of your obedience to him, faithfully calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. God, help me. I'm in trouble today. I don't know what to do today. James 1.5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who braideth not, but give it to all men liberally. It gets pretty simple. Ask God. Well, Jesus, do I really want to bug Jesus? Well, Put it back into that question again. What would you do if you were God? You take care of it, right? Well, that's what God wants to do. You have a child. Let's just say you have a child. Say you have a little baby. And that little baby's about to get run over by a truck coming at it. 
are you going to pull that child out of the way of the truck? Or are you just going to watch and say, baby, get out of the way. Baby, get out of the way. Baby, don't you get the message? Of course you're going to pull the baby out of the way. That's the picture of salvation. Of course you don't understand what's going on. That's why Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Because, in verse 16, by him were all things created. By Jesus were all things created. Oh, so I should ask for help from someone who made everything that literally, as we read it, by him were all things created that are in heaven. Well, okay, that's fine. That are in earth. Whoa, wait a minute. That are visible. Oh, well, okay. That are invisible. Wait a minute. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Whoa, hold on here. Back up, Jack. Are you trying to tell me that principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and all these other things that, you know, Satan and demons and angels and all the man-made confrontations and sin and hell and, you know, evil and all this stuff were made by him and for him? I don't know. What do you think? Boom, boom. What do you think? Can we read? Can we believe? Can we accept that God is in control? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. You take it or leave it, but I kind of like the idea that when God says all things, God means all things. All things mean all things. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but, you know, quite frankly, I'm going to say, ooh, I don't get it, but I got it that you do it. You made the way. Everything was made it made Everything was made that is made by you, for you, and by you, and through you, and in you. So, if I'm not in you, and by you, and for you, and through you, then I'm probably, to put it bluntly, screwed. <laughs> or I'm messed up. Or I'm really in a bad place. I need salvation. So, because he who has created all things that were made by him, and all things were made for him, and by him, and through him, and through him, he also made a way of salvation for us. So, everything, that too, was done by him. Jesus. So, in 17, we read, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Wow! Now there's a scary thought. He's before all things, so before everything that wasn't, that is, and has become, then before that was, he was, and is, and was there before there was, and is, and ever can be anything that was created, because he was and is, in fact, with the Creator, and was there with the creation, and is, in fact, by Him, for Him, and through Him, all things created. Ooh. Houston, we got a problem. We missed out on somebody, you know, that I think, you know, that somebody came along, you know, and kind of shook up the plan, because when he said, I say unto you, I think he had authority. Ooh. Whoa. He wasn't just the Son of Man. Maybe there's more to this Jesus than meets the eye. Maybe there's more to God than we realize, and that realization is that God made everything, and Jesus himself is God, and that being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God as the Son, things were created for him. And now, everything by him, all things consist. So, if there was a Jesus, There'd be none of us. Because there is Jesus, oh, there's a possibility of us. So, who do you think we need to go to when we got to get to salvation? Who do you think we need to receive from when we need to hear from someone who knows about what happened in creation? Who do you think we need to discuss when things go wrong, like they did in the garden, about our situation, which we inherited sin and separation from God, who do you think we ought to talk to, find out from, and learn from 
what everything that consists and has being invisible and visible, who should we go to? Ghostbusters? Who do we call? Jesus. Who do we call? Jesus. Who are you going to call? Jesus. Because if you're going anywhere else, you're really playing the lack of faith game, aren't you? You're floundering in the shallow pool. Because Jesus might simply say to you, uh, I got news for you. I know you're drowning, but you're laying down, and if you just stood up, you wouldn't drown. Oh, you want me to stand up? Yeah, see, that's my salvation. I don't want you to, you know, like, have to worry about someone coming along and dragging you out, you know, or someone you know, picking you up, you know, but all you got to do is stand, having done all to stand, because you're really drowning in shallow water. I got you covered. I had you covered from the moment that I died on the cross and I said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The rest of your life, you're figuring out that I've covered you with my blood. So stand up, and having done all, do nothing and stand and see the salvation I bring. Pretty simple to me. It's all, and by him, all things consist, so all we have to do is go to Jesus. That's what verse 17 will give you the greatest assurance that you could ever want and know and imagine of your salvation. Because of the things you can't see, you can't fight. But of the things you can't see, you don't know what's right. So somehow, between what you can't see and you can't fight, and what you can see and you don't know what's right, I think you ought to go to the one who has all might, and he holds all things together by himself. Jesus. Jesus is the answer for everything. Always has been, always will be. As a Colossian, you're learning that. Because 17 says so. Even as 15, 16, and 17 confirm it. And then in 18, we read something that should be, duh, of course, but we'll read it and say, well, maybe, on course, we need to put re our recourse back to recognizing where we are in relationship to the Scripture. So in 18, it says that, as a matter of obviousness, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. I don't know about you, but you know, I kind of see that as being like, hey, it's Jesus' church, not the Catholic church, not the Protestant church, not the Calvary Chapel church, not the Methodist church, not this church, that church, the other church, or any other church. I think it's like, uh, call me a little crazy, but um, maybe it's Jesus' church. Maybe he's in charge. Maybe we kind of got this idea that uh, he took a back seat, you know, and left you in the front seat so that you could drive. Uh, can I make a suggestion? Get out of the driver's seat. I don't like the way you're driving. <laughs> I don't think you know what you're doing because, you know, you're trying to drive a car where it says pedestrians only. You need to walk with God, not drive God. In other words, Jesus isn't meant for the back seat. And he's really not meant for the front seat. Because if you're driving a car, it's a man-made invention. I think you really want to walk with God more than you want to be driven by God. Then you want to have God driving you. Or you want to be driving God. You kind of get the picture there? Things that are man-made tend to go man's ways. But things that are God-made seem to be held by him as having preeminence over all things. So Jesus is the head of... Uh, what's a body look like when it has no head? Take a chicken, cut its head off, see what happens. It spews. <laughs> Man, I mean, no chickens, they can run like crazy. <laughs> Only they're not clucking, are they? The head is there, but the body's moving. And it's running while it's pumping. Only it don't last so long. Because that body that has its head cut off is just kind of like throwing stuff all around. It don't know where it's going. It'll throw the blood on the ground. It'll throw the blood in the air. It'll throw the blood over here and throw the blood over there. I'm sorry, that ain't going to save anybody when you just throw it around. Especially when you throw it on the ground. But you see, if the chicken head is back on the chicken, at least you can do something with it that's alive. But a dead chicken doesn't accomplish much, does it? you got to eat it, kill it, or do something with it. But the church isn't meant to be a dead church. Because if someone else is in charge, I think you may be finding it's someone else's church. If Jesus is in charge, then I think you know who is the church. And who is the head of the church. And who should be directing the church. And who should have preeminence in the church. 
So when we look at that, we see that he's not only the head of the church, but he's the head of the body. So the body, without a head, really doesn't think straight, doesn't act straight, doesn't accomplish much, and quite frankly, is dying. So we need to put Jesus back into the position of authority, preeminence, conformity to what the body and the head is, to what the church and the leader is, to what whose church it is, and who's in charge of it. So we could ask him what he wants done. And that's what we learn in Colossians, is that we're trying to discover and we're being made led to what Paul is trying to say, look, you're talking about God, dude. You're relating to a guy who created everything. You're relating to someone who has the ultimate, unbelievable ability to have everything, poof, dissolve in an instant, poof, be created in an instant. Who was there in the beginning, who will be there in the end, and you have no clue what you're doing. But here's how you can have understanding. Put Jesus first. Whoa, really? You mean in everything? Well, yeah, why don't you talk to him? Well, I didn't know I could. Well, he's, you know, by him were all things created there in heaven and earth, and he's before all things, and all things consist, and he's the head of the body and the church, and all things might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Well, if everything is going to be in him anyways, then what am I doing outside of him? I mean, shouldn't I be in him? And shouldn't he be in me? I mean, isn't there a prayer like in John when John was praying and Jesus was there, you know, and Jesus was praying for his disciples and he was saying, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You guys just back off for a minute. I want to pray to the Father, so don't listen. Father, I pray that they may be one as I am in you and you are in me and we be in them and them in me and that those even who are here in his name that listen to those words that they say would be in us as we are in you and you are in us. Do you kind of get the picture here? I mean, first of all, we don't, because we can't really comprehend, really, the Trinity. We don't really get this Father, you know, Father's in here, you know, Jesus is in there, and the Spirit is in here, and the Spirit is in there, and it goes like this, and like this, and like this, and it's intertwined in our DNA in order to come up with something that we call this, with our heart, you know, so that Jesus could come in, and that we could have a church, and we could have a steeple, and we could see all the peoples, but the heart of the peoples has to be right, with God so that he is number one, so that the head of the church is over the body and the body is all in one, so that there would be obviously one son in that with which God has created all of us and made us one in his father and the relationship that he has with his father by the spirit being inside us, coming into our heart so that our heart would be as one with Jesus, speaking the words he says, doing the things he said, living the life he lived and being the way that God has said that we should be, which is to know the Father, to know the Son, and to know the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. <gasps> Did you get all that? I don't think so. So, it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Because God said it, and He says, hey, I like it that guy. That's the way I like it. I like it like that. You know, no longer you in charge, no longer me in charge, we be in him. And when we're in him, then obviously we're in him. But if we're not in him, ooh, eek, ouch, did we go outside him? I mean, there's a letter in the seven churches that's kind of a little spooky, you know? It's kind of like Jesus is on the outside, knocking on the door to get on the inside to a church, his church. Now, how did Jesus get outside the church? I don't want to think about that. Let's focus in on Colossians and not be like that. Let's be in him so that if we're in him, then he's in us. And because he's in us, then we're in him. Get the point? And you, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, that is to say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, all things are being reconciled to himself. Now, we see in the book of Revelation when that's going to happen. Now, there's, you know, like this scroll thing, you know, that says, hey, you know what? I own it. Now, I'm not taking possession of it yet because I'm just going to put some money down. So because I'm putting some money down, I'll come and get it when it's time. But I don't want to buy it now. I'm going to make a layaway, you know. So when it's time, I'll pay the rest, you know, the fullness of the earnest money that I'm putting down. Do you know what the earnest money is? It's the Holy Spirit in you. Because he's saying, hey, you know, I'm going to put some money down on you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, you know, so that you can kind of like earn some interest here because I'm going to want my due back. But you know what? I'm not reclaiming the fullness of the purchase yet 
until I come again in glory and I have put everything in order so that everything is prepared for you so that you will be ready for me. Are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to see Jesus? Jesus said, I want to make you servants and I want to commit unto you some of my possessions. I want to give you some responsibilities. I want to give you some accountability so that when you come home to be with me, you'll bring in some things that you know we could enjoy together. The blessings of God that you have inherited from my Father that he's allowed you to participate in that I've done through you in order to give you blessings and glory that you would be able to cast down as a throne before the Father as a crown that you could lay down so that way the Father would receive all glory and honor and praise because of what I have done through the blood of the cross, making all things reconciled either in heaven and on earth, invisible and visible, so that even those demonic things that are being cast into the lake of fire would be reconciled, the perfect justice of God, so that all things that are corrupted would be removed, the perfect justice of God, and cast into fire. All things are reconciled through the blood of Jesus by making a separation from those that have received grace and those that have abused the grace that they could have been saved, but they chose not to accept the fact that all they needed to do was to stand up. So they laid down in that pool of water and drowned. Why didn't you do what I said? Stand. Have faith. Believe. Receive from me. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, in verse 21, by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. You know what you were doing. You were like, you know, maybe bad, maybe good, maybe you were a killer, maybe you were a murderer, maybe you were an axe murderer, maybe you were a child molester, maybe you were an abuser of women, maybe you are an abuser of men, maybe you've been divorced, maybe you've been remarried, maybe you've been... God knows what you did, but they were wicked, weren't they? And yet, even in those works... We know that before him all things consist, and by him all things consist, in verse 17. And we know that for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, and all things were created by him and for him, so that he could show you what's wrong with you, so you would choose to follow him. That's why those wicked works were being reconciled. Because now, as the spreadsheet is laid out before God. Here's his sin. Here's what I did. Here's his sin. Here's what I did. Here's his sin. Here's what I did. Total balance, zero. You owe nothing. You owe nothing. As far as sin and salvation is concerned, God has provided for you. He's reconciled your spreadsheet before God. He's made you a balance that's zero. Now, I want to get on the plus column because I'd rather be in the red than in the black or I'd rather be in the black than the red, you figure which one out that you want to be. I'd rather be under the blood, so maybe it's red. But then again, you know, maybe you need to make some money. Maybe you need to be in debt. Maybe you don't need to be in debt. Maybe you should stay out of debt, so that way you don't have a debt when you go to God. Because Jesus said, you'll be remaining even on earth until you pay the last farthing. So get out of debt. If your spreadsheet is laid out before God right now, are you like in the negative balance or the positive? It's not about works. It's about reconciliation. The scales are going to be balanced. If you still have more time to redeem or be redeemed or pay back that which you borrowed or those things that you owe, I got news for you. Maybe you won't go with Jesus when he says, come up here. He might say, uh, I'd like to take you, but you're not ready. So, you know, go get half baked or full baked and then you'll be ready. Sorry, but you're raw. So you just haven't come there. You don't got enough oil to get in. Sorry, you just won't make it. Wouldn't survive the first day in heaven. Just saying. Reconciled. Jesus is reconciled. You are reconciled if you are in him. And all you need to do to really be reconciled is simply to call. To ask. Because even with the Colossians. In the body of his flesh through the death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, which I, Paul, and made a minister of. Because there was a miraculous thing that Paul was trying to say, look, you guys did it. You made it. You've accomplished. You don't know what you got, but let me tell you where you were at so that you'll appreciate where you're going. Because otherwise, you'll just be simply not remaining in that place of standing up 
and having done all to stand, but you'll lay back down in that shallow pool of water and drown. So in verse 23, the warning is, you must continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Settled. Be still and know that I'm God. Watch and see the salvation I bring. Many people today are caught up into this whole idea that they have to do something in order to protect themselves. They have to be something in order to accomplish for themselves. They have to go out of their way to work out what's worked in them in salvation. When in reality, salvation is just made manifest by the very fact you live. Hey, I'm alive. That's grace. I could have been dead. That's mercy. But because I'm still here, that's faith. I have faith that God has spared me to this day by his mercy so that I would be a perfect example of grace because I'm not dead yet. <laughs> That's salvation <laughs> in a nutshell. What more do I need to do? Simple. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So, when Paul said he was a minister who now rejoiced in my sufferings for you and fill up that which was behind of the afflictions of Christ my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, Paul was talking about how he's gone out of his way to do that work that we all should do, that we can experience in some ways the afflictions of Jesus. The same way that Jesus was afflicted, he said, look, if they've done this to the master, they'll do it to the servant. If they've done it unto me, they'll do it unto you. If you take up your cross and follow me, you will die on that cross like I died. But I will save you. See that guy drowning? He's going to die anyways. He's either going to die in his own despair, drowning in shallow water, or he's going to stand up, and then he's going to take up the means of his own death, which you could call spiritual suicide if you wanted to. You could say, hey, I'm willing to die that I may get the life that God has promised me. I'm willing to die that I may have eternal life in the spirit. I'm willing to die physically that I may live spiritually. So that way, by my death, I have given over my life to Jesus. And the way we do that spiritually is we become born again, not of the flesh, because that's perishing. It's going to die. There is nothing you can do to save your skin. It is dead and it will end. Perish. It's corrupted. There's nothing that can be done to restore it. It will be transformed by the, by the one day when God will catch us up into the air and give us a new body. But besides that, your flesh is of the dust, and from the dust it shall return. It's a promise. It'll happen. It'll go. Don't you know? <laughs> but a new body, spiritual, that's a whole different story. You're going to dispossess of your one to possess the other. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, or present with the Lord. So dispossessed of the flesh will be possessed in the spirit, the spiritual place that God has prepared for us, which is a new body that is equipped for the universe, equipped for salvation, equipped for heaven, so that you'll be able to appear before a holy God, blameless and unreprovable, as Colossians has said, as Paul has been writing to them and telling them. So, when you find yourself in that place of the afflictions of Christ, that means that your awareness of the fact of your salvation isn't simply being there and just simply going by and sliding by and thinking that nothing is going to come to you until the by and by. No, you're going to be afflicted. You're going to be, in some way, challenged to become like Jesus so that you would be grounded and settled in the faith. So that you would have the hope of the gospel that you would not be moved by all these things that are coming upon the world, the end of the world, the great tribulation, the minor tribulations, the false prophets, the false teachings, the false messiahs, the, the political maneuverings, the technological advances, the questionings of the heart, the despair that's upon the world, those things that are happening in the world that are causing you to think that, oh my God, since so much evil has come upon the world, I've lost heart, I've lost hope, I've lost my perspective, I've taken my eyes off of Jesus, I no longer see him in control. God can't be in control because it's so dark, it's so evil, it's getting so bad. It's just birth pains, buddy. I mean, come on, just a baby getting born. Because what does a birth look like? It's a bloody mess. <laughs> I got news for you. What's coming is a bloody mess. But once it's over, it's a new birth. Yes, the world is going to go through a bloody mess in order to become that new heaven and new earth that God is going to bring in the future. 
But until then, you're going to see all oh, birth pangs. And you're going to see things happening that you are not meant to lose hope. You are not meant to be destroyed. You are not meant to be unsettled. You are meant to be grounded. That you are having your feet on the ground and your eye and your head, heart, your heart in the heavens and your head in the one who has given us the mind of Christ, that we could be settled and grounded in the word so that we would know these things that we heard, that they are coming true, that you may go into the afflictions, like Paul has said, that you may experience in your flesh for the church's sake, for the body's sake, for the people around you, for the people that you care about, for the people you want to share the gospel with, you may suffer likewise what the church has suffered, what Paul has suffered, and go through the same things that Jesus warned us you would do and go through. Afflictions, persecutions, death, life, compressions, depressions, all these things. They are the afflictions of Christ that we might go through, and many of us do go through daily even. But it says, but, wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. In other words, because he was going through affliction, he was able to do those things to encourage those that go through affliction. So if you get afflicted, you can minister to those that are afflicted. What you get, you give. The consolation that you receive from Jesus, the blessing that you get from the frustration, the aggravation, the things that make you and break you and cause you to fall flat on your face into that water and that pool of water. When you stand up, you go, oh, oh. Oh, and you look around and you go, hey, stand up. And the guy next to you stands up and goes, oh, oh, oh. And the guy next to him goes, hey, stand up. And pretty soon you got a whole pool of people standing up in shallow water that are going, oh, my God, we were drowning in three feet of water. We could have stood up any time. Wow, thank you for being the person who stood up, who was grounded and settled in the word, who knew to stand up. And just stood there. And we didn't just fall back into the water and drown. We weren't that stupid. We stood up and we stood with you. That's what it is to be of that with which Paul is saying in verse 25, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me to fulfill the word of God by those afflictions with which I am filled up. That is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, which is for the body's sake. Meaning that because I get persecuted, I can minister to those that are persecuted. Because I will go and share the gospel, those that have received it will go and share the gospel. Because you are saved, you are meant to go out and save. That's what you do. That's you, the Colossian. And in verse 27, we look at, For even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, and in 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Jesus in you, the hope of glory. There it is again. God in you. God with you. God for you. Oh boy. God, again, being in control. If it isn't God in you, what do you got in there? <laughs> Ooh. Ick. Ah. Oh. Uck. What comes out of your mouth, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in you comes out of you. As a matter of fact, we're even told that what comes out of your mouth will condemn you, and what comes out of your mouth will save you. I would prefer the latter than the former, because the former might be something that I don't want to do, and I might have done in jest, but in reality, it's what is said that is not blessed, and it's what is the reality of what's going inside me, and so if it comes outside of me, then guess what? I don't think that's what I want to say, because if the tongue is an unruly member, then I think I need to get that sucker under control and shut up, or put up into the atmosphere, so to speak, the things that God wants to hear. I love you, Lord. Uh, I'm not going to cuss anymore. I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to uh, call stupid. I'm not going to do any of those things that Jesus said don't do, or call raka, or any of those things that are kaka, because I don't want to even get caught in any of those situations that God says aren't part of my dispensation of being saved, because I'm a Gentile, and I want to be brought into the mystery of what God has done for me, by giving me Jesus, that the blood of the cross has presented me and made me unreprovable, unblameable before God my Father as that way of salvation that I can just stand up and accept what God has done for me by simply doing what Jesus said, which is to stand up and accept it. Oh, 
Ooh, that's easy. <laughs> wow. Next time I go in the shallow pool, I think I know what to do. Yeah, continue in the faith, grounded and settled. So to whom God would make known his riches of his glory, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man, in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And where are the two I labor, striving according to the working which worketh in me mightily? Because as I work to present the warning to every man, I'm warning them what I see in men. I'm warning them what I have been through in me. What I have done in me, I see in thee. And in thee, I recognize in me, we need to work together to come to that place of accepting the labor that we would strive together, that we would teach every man in all wisdom those things that are profitable for the kingdom of heaven's sake, that we would no longer be caught in pools of water of our own making or circumstances that we have created for ourselves that make us distant from God or those things that would cause us to get frustrated or aggravated like in politics or in religion or in sports or in something that is always distracting from Jesus. Because if we were created, I imagine you think you were created, and that all things were created in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, that means you, then if I am created, then I am created by him, for him, and in him. So if I'm created for him, then I think I need to find out what I should be doing from him. Isn't that what you should be doing? Isn't it a fact that each and every one of us, because we were created for him, haven't we just found out what the will of God is in our life? We were created for him. Not only that, we were created by him. So that means he knows us. That means we were created for his purposes, his design. That means that Jesus knows you Jesus wants you, and Jesus has done something for you that you can know him in a personal and intimate way beyond what you ever thought you could today. He has brought you to a place that he has said, I have given you my word, and I have given you my will, and I have given you my way. I have given you everything that needs today for you to know and have me in you and you in me. God in you, Gentile. God in you, Jew. God in you, barbarian, Scythian, or free, male or female. Because in reality, all of us must have God in us, or God will have nothing to do with us. Because God will cast us aside for that with which we are reprovable and blamable, unless we find through the cross of Jesus Christ, through the blood that we shed on the cross, the redemption that is purchased for us, that God will come and take and reconcile our spreadsheets before God and say, perfect, they owe nothing. They have been redeemed. I take them and I stamp it paid in full. And your spreadsheet is clear before God. That God wants you to enjoy the day, but he wants you to recognize that it's very much so a problem in your life. That you will be drowning at times in the things that are coming along in life. That you will find yourself overwhelmed by those things and areas that you can't see, as well as those things you can see. But because Jesus has reconciled everything to himself, you can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You can be saved from your drug addiction. You can be saved from your repetitive sin. You can be saved from your pornographies. You can be saved from your adulteries. You can be saved from your lack of self-will. You can be saved from every little thing that you could possibly imagine. Because if you have Jesus, you have God's salvation. God saves is the name Yeshua, Joshua. That's what God does. That's what God is about. God is all about being in you. And if he's in you, then you being in him. Which is why you would be grounded and settled. You wouldn't have to go looking for security systems. You wouldn't have to live in fear. You wouldn't have to be fearful of those that come in the night and say, there's a lion, there's a lion. And you run for fear and terror when there is no lion. You'd be like one of those who says, really? Well, wow. okay, Lord, save me. And God saves you. He'd be like Elisha, who laid on his couch and said to his servant, 
God saves me. I don't need to worry. And if God doesn't save me, I'm going to be with God. So whether I be in God distant or in God in the presence, either way, I'll be with God. So either way, it's fine. But look, God, why don't you open my servant's eyes so he could see your salvation? And the eyes of the servant were open, and he was like, wow, there'd be more for us than be those against us. Yeah, the one, Jesus. And the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experience being such that even if God should determine that he wants to put you in a situation where your very life is forfeited, do you think you're really going to die when a gun is put in your face and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into fire? And you're terrified of what? Is there anything worse than being thrown in fire? Think about that. Think about that carefully. Think again. A gun isn't that scary. Being burned to death is terrifying. You know that. That's why we have that inherent fear of the lake of fire. That burning without cessation. So, God, as they shared with Nebuchadnezzar, even if he perished, we'll still be with him. And God was with them. And they were so much so with God, not even smoke. I mean, talk about smoking. Dude, they were living. Because they were in faith. They were grounded and settled in the Lord. They determined what they were going to do in God. They determined what they were going to do with God. And they were found to be with God in their presence. You right now could turn your life around, whatever the circumstances of your life are going through. If you're a Christian and you're going through it, be saved from it. I mean, whatever it is. I mean, some of it may be your problem. You may have brought some of reaping and sowing onto yourself. You may have, like really sown your oats, you know, and now you're reaping the harvest. But God will save you from that. Yes, he will. You may have to suffer some, but you will still be saved. Jesus said he would. As the letters to the seven churches demonstrate, some will go into great tribulation, some will go into some tribulation, some will die, some will live, some will be spared without any other care or concern or worry. But the point is, Jesus is the one who is speaking. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who can lead you to the place of salvation. Because Jesus is salvation. You can call upon the name of the Lord for your situation. If your circumstances are such that you need more faith or more hope or more of that with which God wants to put in you, then be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. It's not that hard. It's not a genius to stand up out of a swimming pool, you know, in the shallow end and find yourselves not drowning. I used to go surfing in the ocean. Now, let me clarify, body surfing. I was not a surfer. I was in Southern California, never learned how to surf. Uh, you know, one of those boards, if I took a board out, I'd have beat myself to death on the board. The board would have hit me in the head or something, or the nose, worse. As it was, it was bad enough that I'd go body surfing because at times, if you went, you know, like you pulled it you know, curled 10 or whatever, or 20, you don't have 20. <laughs> You're headlong. Now, if you went over the wave, you know, you go headlong, straight, straight down, and as you hit the ground, you know, which because the wave curls back, you know, there's ground down there. But what happens is that if you go over the wave and you're riding the wave and you fall down first, you, you go head down and then the wave crashes down on you and then you're discombobulated. You know what discombobulated is? That's, con dis that's discombobulated. That's sir, discomfited. Discomfited. That's, I can't think of what combobulated is, but anyways, it's discombobulated, I think. Anyways, you're all those. You don't know which way's up. You don't know which way's down. You can't see from left to right to up and around. I mean, I was like messed up. My brain was shaking. My body was quaking, you know, and I had sand and snot and whatever, everything else that I got, you know, and it was all over my face and it was like, and I couldn't tell and I was drowning and I'm like, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And suddenly I went, ah, because I was on my knees. And I stuck my head up out of the ocean. Oh, and I was in the shallow end. Oh, yeah, because I had been planted in the sand. Oh, yeah. True story. Fact. No problem there. That's my story. I lived it. I know. That kind of circumstances are going to happen in your life. The waves of life, the storms are going to come. They're going to discomfit you and throw you out of kilter. And you won't know where your GPS is or your your tech devices, and nothing else is going to save you except God saves you. You want that kind of salvation right now? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to know Jesus? 
If you're not saved, then you need to know Jesus, because Jesus will protect you and keep you and guide you and be with you and be in you and take you all the way through until the day that you're presented before the Father, faultless and blameless. In the meantime, God help you if you're out there without Jesus, because I, I don't know how you're going to make it. You know, I don't think you will. I, you'll probably get shot by some gangbanger, you know, or, or run over by a car or, you know, some train will come off the tracks, you know, or these great tribulations that are coming are going to, you know, not just throw you upside down and make you wonder which way's up. They're going to kill you. They'll kill you, man. They're going to take your life away. And you go, no, no, no way. And you say, yes, yes, today, boom, you dead. And that's what God has said. There's only a certain amount of time that you're given. Then it's over. Tick tock and the clock struck and you die. You won't die and be gone forever. You'll stand before the presence of a holy God and have a reality check. Do you have Jesus? Yeah, I do. And Jesus says, no, we don't. Oh, over there. And you're thrown out of heaven. Imagine that, being in the presence of the court of God. First of all, you're blown away by how amazing it is. But then, you're thrown out of there. Ow. Ow. Or, you come into the presence of God, and there's Jesus standing there in front of you. And it says, kiss the sun, lest you be angry. So, ah, give him a kiss for me. You beat me there. But that's really what it is. That's what salvation is. Knowing Jesus and being able to greet the Son with a holy kiss. Being able to love the Son. Being able to be in the Son and the Son in you. To be able to have fellowship with the Father. To be one with the Father and one with the Son and one with the Spirit. Because He loves you. Because the blood of the cross has brought you to that place. Do you want to know that? Ask. Close your eyes if you want to. God, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want him in my life. I want him to take over my life. I don't know how to do it. I'm worried about all these things. I don't know what to do next. God, help me. God, save me. In Jesus' name, amen. You're saved. Yeah, you are. Now, you may be drowning, but, you know, when it's time, stand up, you know, and begin to learn about not swimming in the deep end because you can't swim yet. You're in the shallow end, and you're drowning in the shallow end. That ought to let you know something. You need to know more than just what you're doing. Start reading the Word so that you learn how to swim. Swim in the Word. Swim in the water. Swim in the Lord. Begin to learn of that. Begin to call upon the name of the Lord regularly. In other words, your salvation doesn't end with just simply asking Jesus into your life and then saying, okay, go your way. No, it means every day you've got to ask Jesus into your life to lead you. You ask Jesus in your life every day to save you because guess what? There's some bad stuff going down your door next door and some bad stuff going down your way down the street. And there's some bad stuff happening all around you that you can't see. But because he is of the invisible and the visible, and all things were created by him and for him and to him and in him are all things, you ask Jesus every day to lead you. You ask Jesus to speak to you. You ask Jesus to be in you. You ask Jesus to fill you. You ask Jesus to direct you. As a matter of fact, you ask Jesus to take over every single part of your life. Every day. Yeah, every day. I think it's pretty easy. Maybe for you, that's hard. I don't know. I'm blessed. Maybe you'll figure out the rest. But that's what you are if you're saved. So, God bless you. Now, if you have problems in your life, you know, and you need to talk about it, well, ask Jesus. Jesus is a great listener. He'll listen to everything you got to say. He'll listen and listen and listen, and you can pray and pray and pray and tell and tell and tell. And guess what? God will keep listening and do and move and choose and do what he says he will. Sometimes he'll give you what you don't want, even though you ask for it. You know, because you said you wanted it. You'll learn that way. But there's a better way where you can ask and receive because God wants you to be blessed. So learn slowly or fast or quickly, but learn. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus by reading his word, by studying as we are in Colossians, by asking him to be in charge of your life, asking him to direct your life, asking him to be in your life. Because I got news for you. Some of you that leave your life the way you're leading it really have left God outside and he's knocking at the door and you are a Christian he's knocking and you know that and he's trying to get in because you know what you're not willing to give up because he's already talked to you you can do that but of the afflictions of Christ that are still laid up for me as a minister of God that I want to present you faultless and perfect before the Father would you please let him in would you please let God back into your life would you let Jesus come in the door of your life and begin to work in your life again? Would you please let him take over your life so that you aren't 
with all these issues before God, before time runs out, before there is no more time. Father, I thank you that you've given us Jesus, that in everything he has preeminence, in everything we can know that he has been committed all things into his hands, into his keeping, and by him all things are held together, all things have their being. So God, I thank you that you have given us your son, but I thank you, Jesus, that you were there at the right hand of the Father, still working salvation for us, still interceding on our behalf, still applying the grace we need every day to live our life. Jesus, be in me, be in my life, be in my wife, be in my family and my friends, be in my neighbors, be in the area that I am involved in, be in this place, be in my heart, and be in my way of every day living my life. Because, Jesus, I don't want to go anywhere without you. I want you to be closer than my wife. I want you to be closer than a brother. I want you to be my God. And I want you to be my Savior so that you would save me from every situation I find myself in. Because I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to be. But, Jesus, be in me and lead me in every one of those situations that I find myself in so that I can say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. He delivered me. He saved me. He is my redemption. And God, Almighty, Lord of all, as you have given us Jesus, Jesus, I ask you that by your Spirit, be Lord of my life also. Be the Lord of every situation, every thought, every circumstance of my life, that you would be preeminent in my life, that you would have first of everything, that everything would be considered to you first, so you would lead me. That everything would be taught to you first so that you would direct me. So that everywhere I go and everything I do, it would always be you first. Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and forgive me. So in everything, in all things, give thanks for what God has done. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Be glad. Be thankful. God has saved you. You just haven't realized it yet.